Hey, Sevish here. I'll be putting out new music within the next couple of months, but here's something you can listen to right now. I started a podcast. It's called Now and Zen. If you're getting into microtonal music, hopefully you're going to find it interesting and hopefully you'll learn something new about the weird world of tuning theory. The hosts of Now and Zen are composer-performer Stephen Weigel and myself and whatever guests we happen to have on each episode. On Now and Zen, we discuss microtonal and zen harmonic music, composing with weird tunings and music theory, uh, social challenges, instruments, software. Basically, we talk about anything and everything related to microtonal music. And it's such a good topic for a podcast because every musician who uses microtonal tunings has their own unique approach. You can find Now and Zen on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify, and good old fashioned RSS feed as well. I've provided links in the description so you can get listening immediately or sooner. We're still a very new podcast and have just started growing. We appreciate you listening into our show and especially if you can leave us some feedback so we can make this thing even better. You can reach the creators of Now and Zen on social networks or if YouTube is more your kind of thing. Just leave a comment below. Tell me what you think of the show. I'll try to respond to every single comment over the next few weeks. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about the podcast Now and Zen. I'll leave you with a clip from our most recent episode featuring Elaine Walker. Well, when I was really little taking piano lessons, or it could have been pre-piano lessons, I remember asking mom at the piano, hey mom, what about the notes in between? What Are these all the notes? Why are there just these notes? And then she said ah. something about, oh, well, the history of it, or the, you know, she's a mathematician, so I think she said, well, it started with like Pythagoras coming up with right. intervals, and then we just eventually adapted it. So by Mozart's time, we pretty much adapted this like major minor thing. And that was good enough right. for me all the way up until college. And it was towards the end of my undergrad, and Dr. Boulanger from Berkeley College of Music was my main professor. And to this day, I owe a lot of like, the direction of my life to his mentorship. So... In his <laughs> in his composition electronic music composition class, we walked in one day and he had the DAT machine set up and he said, "I'm going to play a composition in the Bolin Pierce scale," and then he proceeded to oh. sing along, which no one was expecting oh. him to sing. So a lot of the class was kind of just shocked by, "Oh, he's singing!" And so they're like, <laughs> "And but it was so, so beautiful." I was freaking out. Like, all my hair stood on end. I got the chills. I'm like, what is happening to my brain right now? He was singing in the Bull and Pierce scale just completely out of the blue. Like, there's notes from outer space. What is happening? And so after that, I'm like, Dr. B, I'm never going to write in the 12-tone scale again. Like, what is this? So he knew. <laughs> oh, so cool. when I That's taught great. electronic music for 10 years, there was a rare student, you know, maybe once a year, there would be one student that would be interested in it. And I'd kind of latch onto that student and show him the hexagon keyboard and try to get him into it. So I was that student for him. Yeah. So he got me, he said, well, mm. well, young lady, you might want to start with 19 notes per octave <laughs> instead of the pull and pierce scale. <laughs> <laughs> so he had me, got me set up. That's good. See, that's what we needed to know last week when we did what are the best beginner scales. So 19 apparently yeah. worked for you, right? Yeah, um, I said that one because it has a diatonic scale, like 12. And if you play something diatonic in 19, some people might not even be able to tell the difference. But yeah, right. Bull and Pierce is a lot more um, zen harmonic. And since it doesn't have octaves in it, then a lot of things sound really, really alien all the time. So, yeah. I think you it's can't do the normal how you things. Got into it. You can't do normal things like double up right. on the bass line. There's only one of every note. Yeah. Oh, don't don't get me started on the bass lines in in Bolan Pierce. Yeah, I totally agree. You, you can't do that, and it's so troublesome. But most people don't care. So I've asked the community here and there, like, so you know, what do we do about that issue? I just assume we're not supposed to, because you know, sometimes on the synthesizer. The um the sound will be transposed down an octave, and another sound will be transposed up an octave. And like, oh, right, well, right. Pierce, you're not allowed. So we got to get the bass right, the yeah. same t octave as a high bell sound, and then just use whatever notes are available at that point. Well, whenever I mention stuff yeah. like this, most microtonalists say, "Oh, are you kidding me? Just do whatever. No one's gonna care. Just <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah. cheat." So yeah, I yeah. have in in my Drum and Space album. 
I think it's greater good. It's one of the Bull and Pierce ones. There's one cheater note. And I still feel guilty about it. The tablature. Uh, you shouldn't, don't feel guilty about that. I do that on every <laughs> single Bull and Pierce track. I just, um, this, it's because the everything <laughs> else makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Everything else makes sense except for the bass and the sub bass. I feel like the octave is so important there really to get that solid sound. And you, you can't have you can't have All something right. like a tritave down below the bass because then it's like really well, you wobbly. You have to notes. have <laughs> tritave sub bass. So. No, you guys are making me say tritave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Tritu, chartier, tritave. I I keep forgetting. Well, Elaine's way is the best way, I think. Tritive, right? So, so wait, tri- tritive. tritive. But, is that how you say it? Tritive. But I'm American, you know. They probably say it different over there. I've been saying tritave. I, I've been finding out that all these internet words that I've only read from the microtonal community, I'm saying them all wrong, and everyone else has decided to say it the right way, so I'm trying to talk more correctly, I guess. Well, so, some people yeah. say yeah, well. EDO. I always say EDO, and I notice people say EDO. I used to say EDO, and now I say EDO because of Sevish here, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, it's oh, your you fault. you started that? <laughs> oh yeah you know what the last two episodes i've been doubting my pronunciation of scala because i always say scala and you say scala scala and then i saw your video the other day and you doubted yourself and you were like scala scala i'm not sure yeah <laughs> i just yeah, felt I'm really not. proud of of um of making you you know doubt yourself there <laughs> first Edo and then scala what's next uh i can't even think of another word but i'm sure there are a lot um funny temperament yeah. names that are named after people and animals colliding like our gene or whatever. Those are cool. <laughs> well, I'm open yeah. now because I grew up saying T-E-T or Tet, you know, that whole, which was really annoying. I'm, I'm glad in retrospect that T-E-T changed to E-D-O because it used to be 19 mm. tone equal temperament. So just alone, oh, God, no. tone equal temperament <laughs> doesn't sa- stand alone as its own phrase. You can't just say tone yeah. equal temperament. It has to be a number tone equal temperament, whereas equal division of the octave makes more sense because you can say it by itself and it still is a yeah. f- meaningful phrase. But I had all my CDs, all my websites, everything everywhere labeled T-E-T because you know I'm a oh. stickler for labeling every song I write. I want everyone to know what tuning yeah. each song is in and nobody else. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes Sevish does. What do you mean sometimes? Do you always I label do. them? I, I, I put mine in the liner notes, though. I never put them in file names. I put or them in the like file that, name. People... I put it there so no one can miss it. Because that because but that's what I want to know. That naive experience. I want to you know, know what I mean? I'm listening to when I listen to other people's music. So I'm trying to set a precedent, but no one listens to me. You know, I do. <laughs> I think your music's amazing, and I actually copied you. I do that exact same thing with my songs. I also put my tunings in parentheses, although. Uh, this is an interesting issue, actually, whether microtonalists should say that they are, you know, using their tunings, but maybe we're a little bit biased, us three, since we all put our tunings in. I know a few microtonalists, or at least I think a few microtonalists, are pretty passionate about not putting the tunings in so people won't be biased in mm. any way, uh, you we're know. We're trying to train our ears, so I need to know what tuning I'm listening to. So I listen to all this music all the time, and I have no idea. I can speculate all day long. Exactly. You know, like I was just listening to Lois Lancaster's song, blah, 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 has a oh, long name, yeah. starts with an R. And I think it's in the Bull and Pierce oh. scale, but then when it, because it says this album was written almost entirely in the Bull and Pierce scale. So when I'm listening to a song, uh. I'm like, but there's a major third. I keep hearing this major third. I'm like, oh, well, maybe because she's playing that a trit of higher and this. And then I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure I heard another major third together. But then if it was just labeled, I wouldn't have to torture myself. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really advanced that you're, um, you're picking that out and listening for like, uh, tritive stuff, tritive stuff. <laughs> um, because I, I tried to listen to uh, Lois' songs and figure out like notation things like that. Um, and I couldn't really like I couldn't get it on like my keyboard when I put it in Bull and Pierce. Uh, I should put my keyboard in thirteen notes an octave and try and do Bull and Pierce that way. Um, because I know Elaine, that's uh, that's kind of what you do. You and I have that thing where we we take apart keyboards and rearrange them. So. Um, I mean, how did you, how did you originally figure out uh, how to rearrange your keyboards? You've got quite a few, right? Because you've got you have keyboards that are dedicated 
to be in certain equal tunings, and mine, uh, well, the one that I have changes tunings, uh, sort of depending on the performance or what's going on. So, uh, how many keyboards do you have, and what are their names, <laughs> and Let's when see. did you make them? I'm, I'm showing <laughs> my keyboards in this Skype video. Well, there's some. Oh, So, I probably beautiful. have, like, cool. 12 or 15 keyboards, and some of them are uh, not put together. You know, so computer nerds will have keep uh, computer guts everywhere i'm like that with keyboards so <laughs> and this That's one particular <laughs> rather large closet here there's a lot of keyboard guts everywhere keyboards with missing teeth <laughs> and then all my verticals that i actually use are just sitting right here so i got a a 10 oh a yes 17 a 16 and a bull and pierce those are the ones i just showed you are- oh yes, because the Bull and Pierce has um, you have little like black key structures, but they're painted. Is it gray or white? Um, the Dirt Two mode, I think. Maybe I'm getting mixed. Well, up. I have my 16 note per octave one, I have disco keys. <laughs> oh <laughs> the yes, sparkly silver one, so I can tell where I am. But yeah, that's those are the ones I'm referring to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe that would be the best way to deal with um symmetrical keyboard layout. Um, my uh, keyboard right now is in 15 equal, and I'm playing Christmas songs on it, but I have uh, eight white keys and seven black keys, so I think maybe seven black keys is at a point where it's a little bit visually dicey, and for some people, it's too many for them to, like, put their hand on it and immediately orient themselves to, like, the fourth black key or the fifth black key, you know? Um, so, I don't know how many black yeah, keys. Yeah, throw some nail polish on there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Could do that for... For some of the keys. I like the sparkly kind because you can feel it too. It's kind of has a uh, feedback on your fingers. Oh, the, like the like the glitter is kind of like rough. Yeah. a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, why do you um, advocate for the vertical keyboards? I know you have those on your website, but I never have like heard the pros side of that from you. Well, I had a I had a patent pending for one year, so this is what it was. It's very simple. When keyboard players perform on stage, it's always incredibly boring. Just because you uh-huh. can't see their fingers. They can't really run around unless they're using a keytar. A keytar has the downside of not having enough keys. So this is a way to have a full 88 note keyboard. So 88 keys is a little bit much. <laughs> you can barely reach. But, you know, you can have a full keyboard and the audience can see it. Okay. And then the other upside is that even though you have to play your left hand backwards, so you're holding the keyboard straight up like a cello, for those that can't, that don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and right, then, yeah. So your right hand's <laughs> playing normal, your left hand's wrapping around backwards. The, I like it because it gives me that cool brain feeling of like writing backwards or trying to read something in a mirror. Uh. So my mom and I have done experiments where we're sight reading. So she's a really good sight reader. I'm a really terrible sight reader. But we could equal, we could sight read <laughs> almost equally well on the piano. And then we picked up a vertical and then tried the same thing on that. And so for classical musicians, it seems to be okay. There's just maybe a little learning curve. But my left hand just automatically, same thing with my mom, it just flips and I can just play there's no not much of a learning curve. Jazz pianists don't like it from my experience because they use too much muscle memory with the chords in their left hand. So the yeah. left hand being flipped is awkward. Uh yeah. Where if, if the kid is learning, it would be easier, I think, because don't you remember that moment where you you're like, "Oh, now I have to learn my left hand. The numbering's backwards." You know, it's like your thumbs are mm. one, one, two, three, four, five, your pinkies. And then your left hand is yeah, completely yeah. backwards on the piano. So all the fingering is totally different. So it's five, four, three, two, one, three, two, one to play a scale. Whereas your right hand is one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, whatever. Also, um, when you have a vertical keyboard, you're saying that if you were to do something like play an F major scale, the fingerings would be the same for both hands. Yeah. So for oh, little kids learning, or adults or anyone learning for the first time... They don't have to learn different fingerings for their left hand and their right hand. It's just weird right. for people that already play piano. But I personally like yeah. it. I like that weird feeling I get in my brain when I'm playing my left hand backwards. 
But I'm so what you need to do different. now, you, you need to create a vertical keyboard that's actually also an isomorphic keyboard, and then it's like perfectly identical in all keys and all hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, so if I had all thing? the money in the world, I mean, I'm pretty much devoting the rest of my life to trying to raise money, thus the... That's why I'm a landlord and trying to flip houses. I would never have done that other way. So I'm devoting <laughs> my whole life to figure out how to raise money and make keyboards. So I'm just starting with the... I'm not actually starting with vertical keyboards. I'm starting with keys that are easily rearrangeable. That's such an awesome idea. I've okay. explained really, that whole really thing that. to Steven. I don't... So it's going to involve four white key shapes instead of seven. And it's okay. completely unintuitive, That's and it better. involves having to be able to remove keys. And it took me like eight years to figure it out. <laughs> it was a mathematical problem. Oh, right. We, uh, we discussed this at, uh, at Microtunnel Adventures a little bit. I, um, for that, what I, I have is I have different, I have multiple models of the same keyboard. Uh, so Ball State threw one of their keyboards in the trash, and I ended up merging it with a Korg IS-50. Um, or at least the keys I got from the trash. So, since they were both Korg, uh, they were about the same. It's like Keenan Pepper's little YouTube video where he takes the springs out of the back of the keys. Um, right. And does that. And all I had to do was shave off uh, a little plastic nub from the bottom of the Korg keys while they were in the trash so that they would like match with the IS-50 keys. And then since the colors were a little bit different, I painted all the keys pink because otherwise, the core guys' 50 keys were a little yellower, so it kind of looked like, in the early days, it liked to, looked like a mixture of, like, you know, regular teeth and, like, dead old yellow teeth. <laughs> it was, like, two different mouths combined. Yeah.